Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ding, uh, very much for the nice uh, introduction and also invitation again. Uh, today, I'm very honored to have the opportunity uh, to share my research on uh, online monitoring of big data streams uh, to the Data Science Institute at uh, Texas AM. Uh, since uh, Dr. Ding has already uh, given a nice introduction of my background, so um, I, here I don't think I need to mention uh, um, uh, too much details, but I want to emphasize I come with uh, engineering backgrounds and uh, during my uh, PhD study, I mainly uh, focus on the statistic and machine learning. So you can somehow tell my research later uh, from this uh, kind of flavor. And uh, this is the outline of my talk today. Uh, I will share with you first uh, the motivation examples and also what is the problems uh, we focus on uh, since I joined Utah Madison. And then I select uh, three uh, research papers. So I want to talk into more details. So from the publication years, uh, you can somehow tell uh, this shows the research milestone and roadmap in my group. So uh, hopefully my goal is by sharing the stories uh, behind those research uh, uh, those experiences um, can help uh, the future researchers, especially the current PhD students. And in the end, I will also talk about uh, several uh, projects, uh, somehow support the work, and also mention some of our ongoing efforts. Okay, so what is the problem? Uh, indeed, uh, this research I'm going to talk about is motivated from several applications that we encountered in practice. The first one is in the UAV surveillance. Uh, in this case, uh, each UAV is equipped with a sensor device that can monitor a certain area of interest, which we highlight in the yellow color. However, in practice, we often face a much larger uh, surveillance, surveillance needs, but since we only have a limited number of UAVs, so one question here is, how could we dynamically allocate the location of those UAVs in order to quickly detect the intrusion that can happen at any direction and any time. The second example is from our collaborators uh, in, in industry uh, from our SRAM once my students conducted the internship there. Uh, nowadays, uh, hundreds and thousands of sensors has been deployed in the manufacturing plant uh, to manage uh, different uh, uh, data um, for quality insurance. However, one long uh, standing question uh, that is how could we achieve optimal balance uh, between data acquisition and monitoring performance? Although we can uh, install more and more sensors and collect data at higher and higher speed, but one question industry always cares is, is that really necessary? So this problem is more, cri uh, more critical when we talk about uh, the sensor can wear out or we need to change the battery of sensor in uh, uh, hard conditions, or even in some rural area, the bandwidth is constrained. In that case, it's really key that we only collect um, the most informative data that we need. Another application here I uh, coded is from uh, the solar flare detection, uh, which is an uh, interested project in NASA. Uh, at each second, uh, tons of such solar images uh, can be captured by the satellites. And however, one challenge here is uh, um, due to the limited transmission and processing time, not all of the images uh, can be sent back to Earth for real-time analysis. Although they can be recorded offline, uh, however, um, the key question here is uh, in order to quickly detect the volcano, uh, sorry, detect the solar flare occurrence, so uh, what are the most informative data should we transmit and the analysis? So as you can see in all those applications, they actually cause for the same uh, generic methodology development. That is how could we develop a systematic and a scalable adaptive monitoring and sampling strategy so we can actively select uh, the most informative data to observe so we can maximize our detection capability subject to the resources constraints. So one existing literature um, uh, dealing with those resources constraints, uh, they mainly rely on the approach, 
called sampling over temporal domain. So this means uh, I only observe one data frame for several data frames. So here I use a simple example to illustrate the uh, idea. Uh, here I use a blue color shows the sample the data streams and white, uh, white color shows an empty regions. And the black color shows the case when our sample data streams overlap with an empty regions. So like in this uh, figure A, you can see that this means we sample one data frame out of five data frames. However, one thing you can uh, see is if the anomaly occurs between the two sample uh, data uh, frame, then we'll expect a long detection delay or completely miss the events. So to address this issue, our innovative idea is we want to develop uh, dynamic sampling over the spatial domain. So this means that we sample each data frame, but only with uh, partial uh, information. However, if you compare these two schemes, uh, the total number of data streams were sampled are essentially the same. So ideally, uh, if there is nothing happens, since we don't know where the anomaly can occur, so we hope our schemes can behave like explorations. So this means we want to maximally search all possible data streams in this way, no matter what and where the anomaly occurs, we can quickly realize it. And if there's something happens, so we hope it can automatically switch to exportation schemes. So this means we will stick to observing those anomaly regions. In this way, we can uh, speed up the detections. So in the followings, uh, I will uh, show you how would we achieve uh, such a smart algorithms can optimally switch between these two schemes. Okay. So the first paper that I'm going to talk about here is a technometric paper, uh, which is published in 2015, um, which I, I believe lays us, uh, some uh, important uh, ideas for tackling uh, the big data streams when we have uh, partial observations. However, this paper after we published, we realized there are some uh, 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 big limitations, but that's motivated us uh, for the second paper I'm going to talk about later. So here is a generic prob prob formulation. Uh, we consider there are M physical variable available and that we only have Q resources. So because Q is a number smaller or equal to M, so that's why we need to adaptively determine which one to collect data from. And when the process is in control, we assume each variable follows a standard normal distributions. And then at uh, some unknown time, uh, there is shift occurs a certain variable, which will affect another subset of data streams. But we don't know what time, and don't, we don't know which variable affected. So that's why this problem definition is called unstructured uh, non-detection, which is uh, one of the most challenging ones uh, in the literature. And uh, after the shift, each variable associates with a new um, and we don't know the magnitude as well. And we assume here the samples over time are independent of each other. And our goal is based on the dynamic observation in real time, we want to actively decide which data stream should we observe at the nice time in order to quickly detect uh, anomaly while maintaining a system wide across a long way. So in order to help you to understand our algorithms, uh, here I prepared a small toy example where we consider there are five variables, uh, but only two resources are available. And we use the right color to denote which two variables uh, we can observe. At time t0, initially, um, our idea is we will first create a so-called local statistics for each variable to indicate uh, how likely each data stream uh, has, uh, has an anomaly. And then at any time t, we will repeat the following four steps. In step one, uh, we will collect the measurements based on the current layout. Like in this example, since we have resources on variable one, five, then we know what happens in this two variable, but we don't know what happens in the other three variables. And then at uh, the second side, um, based on the real measurements, then we will try to online update our local statistics. And here we just incorporate uh, efficient univariate control charts uh, called QSUM. For those of you who are not familiar with the QSUM, 
uh, Q sum will behave like follows. So if the variables uh, monitor as uh, anomaly, then its corresponding Q sum statistics will accumulate and become really large. If the variables does not have a problem, then the Q sum statistic will fluctuate and eventually go back to zeros. So by observing the trend of the Q sum and its value, then we can tell whether the variables uh, has a problem or not. And for those variables that we do not have real measurements, here our innovative idea is we introduce a small compensation parameter. The, the rationale behind it is since we don't know what happens in those variables, so there is a small chance those variables has already changed, right? So that's why we introduce a such small likelihood to correct such cases. And see, uh, the reason here you see we have two equations is because our problem is unstructured. So uh, they can have both positive or negative changes. That's why we take a maximum of these two parts. In this way, no matter whether a system has a positive or negative change, is corresponding, the variable's corresponding local statistic will be locked. Okay. So in the next step, uh, we will rank our local statistics uh, from the largest uh, to the smallest. And <clears throat> then we'll sum over the largest few local statistics as the monitoring statistic for the whole system. So the difference between the local statistic and the monitoring statistics is, remember the local statistics indicate how likely each individual data stream have a problem. Well, the monitoring statistic is used to indicate whether the systems has a change or not as a whole. And the reason here we only sum over the largest R local statistics is again, because of the engineer knowledge that when the change occurs, it usually only affect a subset of data streams, not all of them. In fact, if the change indeed uh, affect all of the data streams, it indicates a much noticeable detection cases, very easy to detect. So that's why uh, uh, here we sum over the largest field variable. And since, as I mentioned, the larger the local statistics indicate more likely uh, the corresponding variable has a problem. So that's why in the next step, we'll update our layout into the variable associated with the largest statistics. So we can repeat this logic until time uh, 101. And here I plotted the monitoring statistics. So as you can see that, although there are some fluctuations, but there is no increasing trend. Right, so which indicate now the system is still in control. Now let's manually create some anomaly D at variable two, and which can also affect a different magnitude change in variable one, but we don't know. What we do is we just continue run this algorithm. Let's see what happens at time 150. The first thing we will observe is uh, the data streams, uh, 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 the first and the second data streams, they will associate with a very really large local statistics. Why? This is expected because these two variables has a change, right? And this can result in an even larger monitoring statistics. But more importantly, if we look at our updated uh, sense, uh, uh, resources layout, they will stick to observing these two variables. Why? Remember that at each time, we will allocate our resources onto the variable that are associated with the largest local statistics, right? So if the variable has a change, their local statistic is expected to be large. So that's why we want to confirm, indeed, they have a problem by allocating resources onto them. Since we can collect more data, so the collected data will further confirm, indeed, those two variables have a problem. So that's why this can make the statistic even larger. And finally, uh, we will see a scheme that we will exp export um, those two variables. Here, I plotted the monitoring statistics. So it clearly shows a time uh, nearly uh, uh, about 105, there is an increasing trend. So it's indicated now the system is uh, out of control. So as you can see, uh, we call our algorithm as TRAS, which includes the following three steps. First, how do we construct local statistics? Second, um, want to indicate the process out of control. And third, um, update the sampling layout by looking at the variable associated with the largest local statistics.
One of the significant contribution in this work is not only we uh, uh, provide some algorithm works empirically really good, but we also proved uh, two important properties. The property one, what we show that is uh, when the system is in control, our sampling layout will not get stuck into certain uh, variables. So in this way, we can ensure all variables will not be left attended. So this is important because in practice, uh, we don't know which variable can have a problem. So that's why uh, we hope that no matter what and where the problem has a problem, we can quickly realize it. Here, I don't have time to cover the detailed proof, but if you're interested, I'm happy to share the paper with you later. And in the property two, what we prove that is if the system indeed has a problem, then our sampling resources will eventually stick to the anomaly regions. So in this way, we can localize the events. So in the following, I want to first quick show you a, a, a case study uh, based on observing uh, the solar flare. And the solar flare uh, in our case is a sudden and transient intensive variation uh, in brightness in the image. And if we consider each pixel as one data streams, so it contains more than uh, 60, uh, 67 thousand pixels. The data is really large. Um, we talk about 11 terabytes of data collected in one day. So that's why, um, because the data is really large, so even uh, using the current uh, uh, bandwidth capabilities, not all the image can be transmitted back. And in this example, based on the practical settings, we consider only less than 3% of the information is available. However, um, as I will show you later, even though we only have less than 3% of the information, we can still achieve a comparable detection results as one we observe all the data streams. So here is the illustration about our algorithms. And as I play this video, uh, so you can see here shows original solar images. And uh, there's nothing happens. So uh, our monitoring statistic is within this right line, which is a threshold line. And if you look at this image, uh, the white dot shows which pixel that we decide to observe at the corresponding time. So, so far there's nothing happens, so it's behave like a random sampling, uh, like we talked about before. So as I continue playing this video, so you can see there is a, a solar flare occurs and we quickly realize it. Now the first solar flare uh, uh, become mild, so um, our statistic goes down. Now the second solar flare, uh, which is more severe, uh, so appears. So our statistics quickly realize it. If you now look at uh, sampling locations uh, of our data streams, they clearly shows the pattern of the solar flare. This is actually because of the property two. Now you can see that the uh, second solar flare uh, become mild. So statistic goes down again. Now it's become a little bit more intense. So we realize that. And now I believe um, all the solar flare has disappeared. So our statistics uh, now will uh, go back. Um, and if now you look at the location of the sample data streams, they will not uh, get stuck in the location of the original uh, solar flare, which is because of the property one. So we compare our algorithms with the one that uh, depends on uh, observing all the data streams and we achieve very comparable uh, 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 results. And indeed this one um, based on uh, the general -like, uh, 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 generalized likelihood ratio test. So we need to carry a lot of those historical information in mind. Uh, so that's why uh, it's not efficient to be used in real time. But in comparison uh, for our algorithms, uh, remember it has a recursive formula. At each time it only need to remember our current local statistics so it's very efficient uh, to be used in real time. So in summary, uh, in this first talk, uh, we propose a methods um, that can efficiently deal with the big data streams by dynamically sampling the partial observation. And there are two unique advantages in this algorithm. First is the algorithm is very scalable. So because we look at each dimension uh, data stream first, and then we aggregate uh, the local statistics together. So this complexity is only linear in the number of data streams. Second, 
uh, the algorithms uh, can effectively deal with this unstructured uh, anomaly detection problem because we don't need to assume uh, there is any knowledge about the potential anomaly events and it can automa uh, automatically select what are the most informative data streams to observe. Well, there are a lot of uh, advantages in this algorithms, very promising, but one critical limitations we found out uh, is the normal assumptions. In practice, uh, once the dimension increases, it's hard for us to see uh, normal assumptions. So that's why this motivates us uh, to talk about the second paper, which is another trigonometry paper three years later. And in this paper, uh, we uh, extended the normal assumptions. So the problem formulation is very similar, uh, except now uh, you look into detail here is uh, we do not assume any normal distributions. But indeed, we still impose assumption called exchangeable. What do we mean by exchangeable is if we interchange the location for any two data streams, then the distribution in X still the same. So we actually found uh, for some application, uh, like in paper manufacturing or in wafer manufacturing, when we uh, monitor the flatness of the surface, this assumption is often satisfied. Uh, however, it is still not perfect, but there are several ideas uh, that are very important I want to share with you before we talk about uh, the next paper and how could we uh, uh, further extend these assumptions. So one idea is that we uh, found very useful to tackle the non-normal distribution is uh, anti run So what is anti run Assume that I collected some measurements from the p-variables, and then uh, we can do a sorting of these uh, p-variables from the smallest to the largest. Then I can define the anti run the indicator as follows. For example, the first anti run indicator will be the index of the variable takes the smallest value. And why this is important? Uh, there is mathematical proof showing that uh, if there's any distribution change in the original X, it will reflect in a change in the corresponding anti run. So this means by observing those changes in the anti run, we can fully detect the change in the original variables. And this anti run concepts can be fully extended to other uh, anti run indicators. So here we just give an example about the first anti run. But we can similarly define the last anti run, right? The variable takes the maximum value. And indeed, it shows that in order to detect um, the negative or the positive change, uh, it will be sufficient to monitor the first anti run and the second anti run, uh, last anti run, sorry. Uh, but in this case, uh, for illustration uh, uh, purpose, in the polling, I will just use the first anti run. Well, the anti rank uh, definition is very promising um, because it does not rely on any distribution assumptions, right? It's non parametric. But um, when we directly apply it into our scenario, we found the anti rank definition will not be well defined. The reason is because, like in this example, um, when we have a six variable, but since um, uh, we cannot observe what happens in variable four and six, in this case, even though the third variable take the smallest value, then we cannot assign one to uh, this variable as the conventional anti run However, after some serious thoughts, uh, we, uh, we can interpret when the traditional uh, uh, anti run assign one, it uh, can uh, explain that is 100% of confidence this variable will take the smallest value, right? So that's why this motivates us to develop, uh, 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 to generalize the anti run definition. Uh, like in this case, uh, we can assign a parameter uh, which is smaller to one and larger than zero to indicate how likely this variable will uh, indeed take a smallest value. And for those variables that we don't know what happens, then we adopt the first paper idea by assigning such a compensation parameter. And you may wonder why there is, uh, we always assign a zero at the end, like a constant. Uh, this is try to correct a scenario that when all the data streams have the same on, amount of shift in one direction. In this case, you can see that the corresponding anti rank will not change. So that's why we need to add a such reference zero to detect the change in such cases. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> 
Indeed, that depends on different scenarios, then we'll assign those three parameters uh, in these generalized anti uh, cases. However, uh, there is uh, one important uh, equation that we must need to satisfy in order to uh, make our generalized anti grant definition theoretically sound. That is, the expectation of the generalized anti grant indicator should equal the anti grant indicator one, um, 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 uh, the system have four observations. So using these uh, equations, uh, we can finally derive the relationship between those three variables, three parameters. So it turns out once we know one parameter, then we can uh, corresponding, uh, correspondingly determine the other two parameters. So that's why the effort is still same as the first paper, uh, that we only have one tuning parameters uh, we need to uh, decide its value. So <clears throat> based on the generalized anti-run uh, indicator, then our algorithm, we call it NAS, also uh, includes including three steps. First, like the first paper, we need to construct the corresponding local statistics. But one challenge here is we don't have the distribution, right? So that's why we uh, rely on a variant of the traditional QSUM. Um, but the idea is still similar um, that we will build a local statistics based on the generalized anti run indicator, which depends on the true observation. And then there will be another statistics behave like the expectation of the corresponding local statistics. One, there's no anomaly. And then we can compare the observed one with its expected value to come up with monitoring statistics. So you can see that if there is a large difference between these two, it will indicate the system is wrong, right? And regarding the sampling strategy, it's still the same. We will look at a variable associated with the largest local statistics. And uh, in this work, um, uh, we also uh, somehow theoretically, uh, uh, theoretically proved uh, two similar properties as the first paper. Uh, the conclusion is very similar. Uh, like when the process is in control, our layout will not get stuck right, in certain uh, variables. But I want to clarify that uh, the efforts in the proof is uh, uh, very different because now we don't have the distribution information available. So that's why we have to uh, 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 approve it based on the non-parametric uh, schemes. And uh, for these uh, uh, cases that uh, one the system has anomaly, then uh, we also show that uh, eventually our algorithm will stick to this variable associated with the largest uh, with the large mean shape. So in the following, I want to first quick show you some simulation uh, comparisons. Uh, based on uh, several algorithms. First is our TRAS algorithm uh, based on normal assumption. Another is a QHO3. These algorithms are uh, assuming full observation available. Uh, so you can see that this uh, comparison is indeed not fair, but somehow we want to show uh, how much capability we lose by only observing partial observations. And the last algorithms uh, we consider is a random sampling. So the QSAM procedure is the same but we randomly select of which variable to observe. And we consider all the algorithms uh, with a different amount of shift and different uh, 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 observable variables. So the first case is we look at is one monitoring anomaly. So in this case, um, the QHO3 actually behaved the best because it can unfairly observe all the data streams. And the TRAS algorithm actually behaved the second. And, uh, and our algorithms are the third. The reason is because now um, the normal assumption is fully satisfied in the tracks. And in that case, this algorithm actually um, 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 has the best performance. And in comparison for our trace algorithms, because it's non parametric so it does not rely on the original uh, observation information. It transforms into an anti run So that's why it loses some of the information. That's why in this case, when the data is uh, normally distributed, our algorithm is not powerful as trace. However, the scenario is totally changed when we talk about non-normal data, like the exponential distributed data. In this case, uh, the trace algorithm degrees really fast, but our algorithms uh, are, are still achieve uh, really good results. And we also test other like even discrete distributions, and the conclusion is also very similar. 
So as you can see that in the second paper, uh, what we actually, uh, our main contribution is we find a way to extend uh, the normal distribution into a non-parametric framework. However, uh, limitation is we still have to assume uh, the homogeneous assumptions, uh, which means um, all the variables uh, uh, need to satisfy the exchangeable uh, assumptions. But in practice, uh, the data can follow different distributions. This is indeed uh, what we realized and want to solve in the recent paper, which is uh, published in ISE transactions. This is collaboration with uh, 12 of my former PhD students and also a group of researchers from 3M and also ERDC. So indeed, this is a problem uh, that we realized when my students conducting the internship in 3M. And at that time, um, they uh, give us a, a case study that includes uh, heterogeneous data streams. So we indeed um, a, a shot of methodology to deal with it. So you can see in this problem formulations, uh, everything is uh, uh, similar to the previous, except now we do not impose any distribution assumptions. So all the data streams are heterogeneous. They can follow arbitrary distributions. So the way we deal with the heterogeneities is uh, instead of assigning those constant parameters like before uh, to compensate for the uh, missing observation or the variable taking the smallest value, we incorporate with uh, a Bayesian schemes by modeling this anti rank indicator with a categorical distribution, where uh, the distribution uh, uh, has a parameter theta t that uh, capture the true time varying status of the system. And we further uh, uh, incorporate a, a Dirichlet distribution due to the conjugate prior of the categorical distribution to model this uh, underlying parameter theta. And in this way, once we got uh, the new observations, then we can online update our belief in the theta, right? However, this is only theoretically sound if we know all the observations. In practice, uh, we don't know the observation. So as I mentioned, our anti-run indicator is not well-defined. So to address this issue, uh, we introduce a parameter called omega, where we define omega as follows. So for those variables that we do not have measurements, then we'll assign the conventional anti-run indicator gj to this omega. The rationale is since I don't know what happens, right? So the chance for this variable taking the smallest value will be like the case when all data streams are observed and this value take the smallest. And for the other cases, like when the data stream is observed, but not the smallest, then we have 100% uh, uh, confidence this variable will not be the smallest. So that's why we assign zero. And for the remaining cases, we assign the value to be summation of GK, K over all the observed data streams. So a quick uh, validation for this uh, kind of parameter setting is we take uh, a, a summation of all the omega j for all the data streams, it will equals one. So satisfy the probability law. And with the definition of omega, then we can online update the uh, alpha. And also uh, we can uh, 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 catalyze uh, the posterior of uh, the theta hat by maximizing its posterior. And in this way, uh, with the more accurate estimation of the underlying status, we can uh, correspondingly define the first anti run indicator uh, as follows. The logic is similar to before. One is unobserved, we assign theta hat. If it's observed but not the smallest, we assign zero. And for the other cases, uh, we assign a uh, summation of uh, uh, theta hat k, k over all the observed value. So one thing you may wonder here is um, the omega, uh, like in the previous page, and the eta here is very similar. So why don't we use omega directly as anti rank indicator? So indeed, uh, they look very similar. And when the process is in control, we can indeed even show the expectation of eta equals the expectation of omega. So there is no significant difference. However, the key difference is when there's a anomaly happens. So in that case, um, you can see that omega, since they fully uh, uh, defined based on the in control parameters, so it's not sensitive actually to realize a process change. 
So, however, this uh, anti-rank indicator EPA, they based on the real-time status estimation of the theta hat. So that's why it, it is more sensitive to detect the process change. So that's why our first anti-rank indicator is defined in this way. With the definition of the new anti-rank indicator, then uh, we can uh, follow the previous logic. Uh, we call this new algorithm as ADS. We can construct the QSUM statistics and also the monitoring statistics. So these two steps are exactly the same as our second table. So one little modification we made is in the sampling strategies. So remember that in the previous paper, uh, we will sample the variable associated with the largest local statistics. However, this strategy we found is not efficient when we deal with uh, um, uh, uh, heterogeneous data streams. The reason is because since the data streams are heterogeneous, so there will always be some variables that are associated with a little bit larger local statistics. So this means if we just sample based on the rank of the statistics, some variable will always be favorably sampled than the other. So if the change indeed happens in those non-favorable variables, then we'll have a long detection delay. So that's why one modification we introduced here is we are inspired by the constant sampling idea we will draw a sample from a Dirichlet distribution where the parameters will be proportional to the local statistics. And then we will sample the data streams associated with the, uh, uh, where our sampled Y. Because we're adding such a small uh, perturbations in the distribution, that's why these schemes can uh, better uh, 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 encourage the explorations between the heterogeneous variables. And when the system indeed have anomaly, since the corresponding local statistic will become really large. So even we add such a small uh, perturbations, we will not change uh, much in our sampling scheme. So that's why it can still maintain the exploitation scheme. So this is one of the key ideas. So uh, in this work, uh, we have also explored is theoretical properties. Uh, so far, what we can prove is one, there is no anomaly, and when the, all the data streams are independent, we can show that expectation of theta hat equals expectation of eta and equals the anti run indicator when we have all the data streams available. So the, the take home message about why this theorem is important is first, uh, we can show that um, the theta hat is indeed an accurate estimator of underlying process. Second, as we mentioned, in order to make sure uh, the QSUM uh, procedure are valid, we need to uh, uh, prove the expectation of our new def uh, defined anti run indicator equals uh, the anti run indicator when we have the full observation available. And here I want to mention that the eta here for each data stream is corresponding, uh, eta j is different. So, this is the reason why we can effectively handle the heterogeneities among the data streams. Okay, so in the following, I want to show you more comparison studies. In this time, we consider the second paper algorithm, which is the TRESS, uh, assume uh, homogeneous assumptions, and we consider the random sampling and also the QHO1, uh, which uh, need all observation available. And similarly, we consider different amount of shift and different uh, choice of observable value. And in the first simulation cases, we consider half of data streams are standard normally distributed and half are post distributed. By investigating the generalized anti rank indicator, we find that there is only low level heterogeneities in their anti rank indicator. So, and here shows the monitoring uh, and detection performance. And uh, again, the QHO1 uh, is the best performing algorithm because uh, it observe the full data streams, uh, full data streams. And you can see that our ADS algorithms uh, 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 is the second. Um, and the NAS algorithm becomes the third. But the difference between these two is not that much. One reason is because remember here, we only have a low level heterogeneities. So that's why the exchangeable assumption is nearly satisfied, right? That's why the NAS does not degrade too much. And another thing I want to highlight is if you look at the case when we have four out of six observations available, our algorithm is already very comparable to the QHO1. So 
In this slide, I want to show you more insights about what exactly happened in our results, why it can detect the change quicker, uh, very quick, quickly. Um, so here we shows the uh, shift, uh, 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 we shows the beta estimation of the state ahead, state one ahead, when the shift happens at the first data source. The first thing we validate is when there's no alarm here occurs, the state one ahead estimation is indeed equal, expectation indeed equals the G1, the anti rank indicator, when we have the full data streams available. And this is also validate our theorem. And if there's change happens with a different amount, you can see that our estimations of theta one is deviate from the underlying G1. And also if we have more observation available, then um, the deviation become even bigger. So this explains the reason why we can detect a change and also uh, the change will detect faster if we have more observations and also the change magnitude become more significant. In the second cases, uh, we consider uh, more heterogeneity uh, cases, uh, all the data streams follow different distributions. And by evaluating the anti-rank indicator, we found there is a medium level of heterogeneities. And in this case, you can see that nice algorithms are actually degrade very much. And our algorithms still achieve a satisfactory uh, detection performance. We have also considered other challenge scenario like monitoring multivariate uh, 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 normal distribution data where the data is correlated. And it turns out uh, there is uh, even higher heterogeneities. And to monitor such data, you can see that the nice algorithms are totally fail but our algorithms still achieve really good results. In the following, I want to show you a quick case study uh, by monitoring the semiconductor process, where we have 100 data, uh, 150 data streams, but only uh, uh, 20 of them are, are observable. And by evaluating the uh, anti rank indicator, we show that there is a high heterogeneities among those 150 data streams. So here shows uh, uh, the animations of these algorithms. And uh, I cannot plot all the 150 dimensions, so we only plot it 21. Now system is in control. And after 50, there is a three variable suddenly become out of control. And we quickly detect that. And the green color shows which data streams we decide to uh, monitor. And here a further shows the percentage of time being sampled uh, in the three variables after the change and before the change. So you can see that uh, when the change occurs, indeed we um, uh, spend uh, significantly more resources into these three variables. So which we mean by exportation. We have also compared this algorithm with NAS uh, when we have a different amount of observations available. So all the cases showing when the data follows heterogeneous uh, distributions. So indeed um, the uh, not, uh, the ATS algorithms uh, is much better. So uh, this concludes uh, the third work where we finally develop some efficient algorithm and deal with uh, heterogeneous data streams. And we also uh, provide some theoretical justifications and also validate these algorithms uh, using simulation and case studies. So there indeed, uh, you may wonder uh, how our efforts uh, can uh, uh, support and continue for those like several years. There are indeed several projects actually behind it. The first project is uh, we started by uh, uh, receiving a funding from Air Force and Antarctic Research, where we're particularly interested in studying the solar activities. So um, the White House here, uh, as mentioned, is a data stream we decide to observe because when the solar flare occurs, it can greatly affect the uh, Air Force activity. So that's why in this work, uh, uh, we receive such funding for studying uh, that mechanism. And later on, we also have received another funding from 3M and then supported by uh, NS efforts and then supported by 3M. And as I mentioned, during 3M, uh, um, um, we realized the new challenges for monitoring the heterogeneous uh, data streams. And the use case is actually very similar to the semiconductor process that I presented. And during my internship, my students also helped uh, 3M to implement the algorithm we developed. And we indeed uh, see that a great reduction um, and saving in uh, collecting the data, but we still maintain such uh, high detection capabilities. 
So there is another uh, uh, project I want to highlight a little bit, uh, which is ongoing efforts uh, funded by US Army Corps of Engineers. And in this project, uh, we're targeting um, uh, more challenging monitoring uh, uh, scenarios, like what happens when the sampling uh, uh, frequency is even different among the data streams, and even uh, when uh, the sampling may not even align. And also, we try to explore more advanced uh, data acquisition capabilities and balance the data acquisition and the monitoring performance. And recently, uh, we, uh, we, we actually uh, introduced uh, reinforcement learning into this framework, and we achieved uh, 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 really good results. Hopefully, in the future, uh, if there's opportunity, I can share more with you. So here I want to draw a quick summary. Uh, within this uh, roughly 15 minutes presentations, uh, I quickly uh, go through these three papers, showing uh, one after the other and how we realize uh, the limitations and tackling those and then realizing another limitations. And uh, due to time limits, there are other extensions I cannot uh, talk about. Uh, for example, uh, we also uh, collaborated with Operation, uh, Operation National Lab and even uses algorithms um, in climate simulations. So one challenge they are facing is they can generate simulation really fast, but saving the data to hard disk is really slow. So we even use this algorithm to help them to determine what are the most informative data they should consider to save during the simulation. And another extension is once we have some domain knowledge about anomaly patterns, that we can incorporate such domain knowledge into our sampling scheme. In this way, uh, we can develop a more uh, uh, like, uh, like smarter algorithms uh, to quickly detect anomaly. We have also explored other capabilities, uh, like how could we best uh, augment the information for the unobserved value? Because in the first two paper, you can see that we augment the value based on constant. So uh, is that possible to, based on the online observation, we determine the best strategy to augment the value. The last paper is uh, what I want to uh, briefly highlight. Uh, we will say it is uh, another breakthrough uh, that we found another way to uh, fully deal with uh, heterogeneous data streams. But the logic is very different from the anti-run. So um, uh, anti-run, if you consider, it is perfect in the sense that it can handle non-parametric distribution but uh, it requires to do cross reference, cross uh, comparison, right, at each time. So the efficiency will uh, somehow decrease if we monitoring a really high dimensional data streams. So in this work, we actually uh, 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 rely on another approach based on quantile based. So this one does not require to do cross comparison. It only needs to vertical compare uh, the data streams with itself. And we further coupling with uh, Thompson sampling, and we show that this can greatly reduce the computational cost, but still uh, achieve a really uh, promising detection performance. So here is a final publication list about uh, all this work that my research group developed uh, since I joined Madison in uh, 2013. Okay, so um, that's pretty much about what, I'm, uh, what I plan to talk about today. Uh, thank you. Any questions?